I'm happy. I'm always happy when the three, two, one works. <laughs> First of all, I'm happy. I'm blessed to be here. Um, my name is Dr. Tova Goldfein. We are live now from Israel. It's 5:30. From Bucks County, where I'm from. 15, 20 minutes away from Dan, where I grew up and lived. So Dan and I have a lot in common. He's living in an incredible place called New Hope and outside of Philadelphia, a gorgeous part of the country. Dan Buglio is um, evening in, in, in America. Yeah. And Dr. Talia Steed is here from Australia where it's mid morning. So I'm just international, which is, I'm speechless. When is so <laughs> speechless, but be this international. Thank you to the internet. Thank you to Michael Galinsky for giving me the motivation to, to get techie when he was like, just start doing it. Stop being a victim, Toba. Just get techie and do what you want to do for Michael Galinsky. You're always a damsel in distress, he says. I said, you're right. <laughs> so I went out on a limb and got out of my comfort zone and I've been techie for three mm -hmm. years. And I'm happy to be here. Um, this is TMS Roundtable Global and we are weekly bringing um, methods and insights to inspire and educate you, not just to keep it in your head, to implement and apply in your day, every day with awareness and compassion. You need that compassion to come out of your comfort zone and be well, your God-given um, capabilities to be healthy and strong and live a quality life. So what happened here real quick is that I had a colleague who introduced me to this article that this Dr. Talia Steed from Australia wrote. And I saw the article and I contacted Talia about three months ago and she was available to speak with me. And we had an amazing show about her healing process and her healing journey and her had being a doctor now being a holistic doctor. But she mentioned how Dan Buglio really helped her. He was written up in her article that made him very happy. Then when Rose passed, um, I got contacted by a lot of my fellow colleagues and I asked Dan and Dan reached out and I said, would you be on my show? And how about if we do a threesome with Talia, Dr. Talia Steed? And he was like, I'm there for you, Tova. So this has been amazing for me um, just to meet the two of you together and be um, healing in, in the moment here, ourselves and others. So, what I would love to start with, besides talking about the topic, but I wanted to bring your names up, um, really, really important topic I wanted to, sh to bring up tonight and share with some of our listeners. Um, so first of all, tell me, Talia, there's lots of people on the internet, but you were drawn to what Dan had to say, which you wouldn't be, but tell me about that. Yeah, well, what happened was I was like, on this endless search for things to help, going through the 10 years of all these gut issues and repetitive thoughts and, and you know, you're always seeking outwards. And then I came across this naturopath in, um, again, like the amazing thing about the internet, she, she's in Sydney and um, her name was Danny. And then she had gone through her own healing journey as well related to all this kind of stuff. And she said to me at some point, like we started with the herbs and I was taking these herbs and I wasn't really getting anywhere. And then she mentioned Dan. And so I thought, she mentioned him the first time and I kind of thought I was probably too distressed to even take it in. And then we had further conversations, still taking the herbs, nothing happening. And she said, have you looked into Dan's stuff? And then I thought, okay, let me have a look. So that's when I started watching the videos mm -hmm. and reading more about everything. And, um, yeah, I feel like that was, and that was only at the beginning of this year. Um, and, yeah, I feel like that was the beginning of the true shift. Wow. Um, yeah. So since, and then I wrote the article. So then I, I love to write, obviously. Can you tell us about the article a little bit because it's going to, it's going to talk a little bit about our topic. Yeah. So, so the, you, wait, you, you, you went back and forth with Dan and his. So, so what happened with Dan is thank you, Dan, all the, for all your um, support. Um, because, you know, when I'm sure a lot of people out there can relate when, and Dan probably gets a lot of these messages. When you're in distress, when you're in the peak of the anxiety, when you're in that grip of fear, 
and you're desperate, it's like that amygdala takes over. You're not using your rational mind. You'll do anything just to get something from someone and you're messaging people and you're seeking help. And then I reached out to Dan several times and very kindly Dan would reply. Um, and that was always so helpful. And, yes, I really appreciate that from the bottom of my heart because it's horrible when you're in that much distress and I'm sure a lot of people can relate. Right. And I guess part of the own, your journey also is learning how to not do that and not be that damsel in distress like you mentioned and start to do it for yourself. But that's a journey and I think um, we all need that self-compassion to realise that because it can be very embarrassing right. to, to, you know, that you sent all these messages and reach out like that but it's to have that compassion and then to learn how to self-soothe and do it yourself what do you would you remember dan when talia when dr talia contacted you do you remember around that time or what was going on or what she was um, talking about or well i didn't think it would lead to an article <laughs> right up in it but um yeah i get tons of messages and uh it, it's hard to keep up these days I mean, I've probably got two dozen emails that I have to get back to, which right. is crazy. Right. Um, but yeah, I, I try to help out when I can yeah. and um, just do as much as I can to point them in the right direction. Watch this, watch that. Here's the key things that you really want to pay attention to. Here's the key concept. Um, and I'm thrilled that, you know, Polly was able to get a lot of benefit from it. I think the key thing from, from, from you, Dan, that I always got was when you're in that panic, and I'm sure a lot of people out there can relate, you do, as you say in your videos, you do go back to is there something actually wrong? So that's the, that's for me that's like the key thing. You, you go back to is this physical, is this something someone's told you before, and you just default. So to have that reassurance from an external and then in, your own internal source in those moments like as you say Dan it's easy and when you when you calm when you relax and you're symptom free it's, it's in those moments so I think that's really what what Dan gave me that reassurance that this is it you know what it is and you know keep going well for the listeners we could just you know I always say and tell me what you you know always tell me if you agree like check the evidence what's the evidence you know, is there, is it physical? Is it chronic? You know, how long is it like, you know, because we, we do get wrapped up. I mean, we are, and I talked about this in our prep, like we're not against the medical system, mm. medical system. We want to integrate with the medical system. Mm. So even if, you know, the evidence is you have nothing wrong, even if there is something going on, I mean, it is physical. Mm. It's just the cause is psychological. So we gotta and I think that. the important thing with what you said is because even myself as working when I was working as a doctor, had the resistance against the medical profession. But the important thing is to realize that any of us, even if we've gone through a mind-body symptom, any of us can get anything at any stage. So it's also to have that awareness of, you know, what we call in medicine the red flags. You know, if someone started bleeding from the bowel or something, that's not a mind-body symptom. You know, like I think, and that's where medicine comes into play. But can we agree that your reaction or response to what's happening physically is that's the mind body work? What do you think, Dad, about that? Because it's, it's a relationship with your pain or your condition. Yeah, I think, you know, the mind body approach that I teach is all about safety. Trust the body, knows what to do, and teach the brain that we're actually okay and we can relax. So even in the case of a true accident, um, I had a woman in my group who literally had a fall and fractured her uh, ankle pretty badly. But as she was laying in the field trying to get her wits together, she was like, I got to stay calm, remain, you know, aware and not panic because this was a, a woman who's in her 70s uh, and just fell and broke her ankle pretty badly. And she said, by remaining calm, that helped with her physical healing because, and, and it also helped minimize the severity of the pain. Yes, exactly. This is the, this is the truth. Yeah. This is where her brain chemicals and her thoughts 
determined her future. This is this is the Joe Dispenza work that I'm, I love. Like this is where I know I'm hurt. I have a choice. How do I want to react or respond? Beautiful example. Beautiful example. Yeah, and, and the way I position it is that the perception of danger is what turns on pain and can keep it going if the perception of danger continues. Um, so in the case of a true accident, the perception of danger is real. I fell, I heard a crack, I broke something, right? Uh, but in many cases, in my opinion, the vast majority of chronic pain, the perception of danger is a mistake. It's a misperception based on bad information. I got a bad back or I threw my back out, whatever that means. Dr. Sarna used to joke about that term. Where'd you throw it? Right. <laughs> I never heard him say that. That's funny. <laughs> um, he, he, yeah. He, he used to kind of joke about that. Um, oh, I picked up something too heavy. Well, if it was too heavy, you wouldn't have been able to pick it up. Right. He, he, <laughs> he was so, he was so black and white. <laughs> but, but I love that. Um, and so I believe the body is much more strong and resilient. Uh, injuries hurt instantly the moment they happen. And over time, they get better and less painful. Uh, but I have so many people say, oh, I injured myself 10 years ago. I'm like, well, tell me what happened. Oh, well, I bent over to do something. And I'm like, so why hasn't that healed? Oh, uh, I don't know. It's, it still hurts. What's your evidence of injury? The pain. Okay. <laughs> Well, did they find anything on a scan? No, but they keep talking about their injury, injury, injury. And all they're doing is giving their brain a really good reason to keep the alarm sounding that yeah, I've got damage. I've been injured. It never healed. Yeah. And we've all heard stories of people saying, oh, I've got an old injury from high school. And, you know, every time it rains, my ankle hurts or leg hurts, you know. And there's a lot of folklore around that, that people just believe is accurate. And yeah. I truly believe that all injuries heal. And if we just trust the body, it can heal. But we can also take a real injury or let's say a surgery. Um, I interacted with a woman who had knee surgery several years ago. She didn't want to have it. She was kind of pushed into it. It was probably TMS to begin with, but she had a knee surgery. And she was outraged at how painful it was post-surgery. And she was convinced the doctor messed up her knee and literally screwed up the surgery. And she literally took a routine surgery, turned it into chronic pain at a very high, severe level because she was so convinced the doctor bat or botched the surgery and that she had a real problem, even though she had an MRI six more times and nobody could find anything wrong, her brain was convinced by her conviction yeah. that I got a bad knee. Yeah. Wow. And she, she could barely walk. So that's the power of the story. That's the power of the perception in the brain creating pain and keeping it going. Um, so for me, the answer is simple. If the perception of danger is the problem only one answer yeah. solution to safety yeah. put the two of them together to override that fear with accurate knowledge of what's going on so yeah. i know a handful of our clients um that i've shared with dan and um the but the, the obsession like i always try to you know address them from the show like you know you know out there who you are and i love you dearly and i want you to get better and i want you to i'm your greatest cheerleader but if you keep obsessing because the symptom, it's like, it's like, and then we're talking about the, um, you know, the extinction burst, like I get better than I get worse. And then they're back in, in, the, in, in, in what I call the, you know, the quicksand, like, can we address like the, the, the obsessive thoughts and the, so let's get, now I want to talk about the fear pain cycle. Cause that's Someone what happens. Asked, do you want to address the question? Yes. There? Yes. This person just taunt, I saw this person just left me a message. So I'm happy that you're here. Moonless sky, what a beautiful name. <laughs> Let me just um, show up. I want to show your question and have um, Dan and Dr. Talia answer it. Is it okay to take medications? I believe in the TMS theory and have been practicing for six months, but I feel I need some assistance. 
Can I answer that uh, uh, first? Sure. Yeah, I just want to say I'm okay. I'm personally fine if you want to smoke a joint or take a cigarette. You know, we're not we're not here to say don't feel the pain, stop the pain, be happy, and go meditate. We're here to say have a relationship with this symptom. And if and, and even what I learned in some of the Gordon work, and I learned with studying with Dr. Hanskin, like you, you cannot dress and be in a relationship with your pain when it's high and you are number 10, you can't, your brain is, you're in fight or flight. So calm down with whatever you want, take whatever you need, but don't stop the relationship, the journaling, the meditating, the understanding, the compassion with your body, mm. but be aware of the cause, be aware of the danger, be aware of the threat and then bring safety. I think that's so, I think that's so important to say because I know like myself and other people that are so dedicated to their personal growth and addressing things in that um, natural way and and but we're not meant to suffer. So if there is something out there that can just dull it down a little bit while we're still doing that work, like I think that's really important because half the problem, like um, I think Dan, you wrote with the personality traits half the people that get these things are very diligent perfectionistic driven people so part of the healing is a, is really the cultivation of that self-compassion that if I really need this little tool while I'm still learning while it's still a journey to implement Dan's techniques and the things out there that's okay I think that's so important excellent yeah Answer. I know early on, Dr. Sarno was pretty strict, no physical treatments, and he advised against medication. But later in his career, I think he eased up on that and became a little bit more gentle about it. Um, I know Dr. Howard Schubner, and I know his take is, you know, if you need it to get through the day and be able to focus on this mind-body work, then take it until you no longer need it. And I agree with that completely. Mm -hmm. I'm never a big fan of depriving yourself of some comfort and torturing yourself to get mm -hmm. better. What point are you proving? Yeah. You know, at that point, you're just giving yourself a setback because you're now forcing yourself to go through the worst agony. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that gets you anywhere other than more fear. Yeah. I'll share a personal example on this. I, I know I said to Toba I wouldn't. Yeah. Just because it's very, very <laughs> real. I want to hear your voice. I want to hear your philosophy. No, like I think I I really, really suffered with the constipation. And it, it's not something people talk about a lot. And But it was such a traumatic experience in itself because what I would do is try and I could tell that my nervous system was just in so much fight or flight. And so it would be like, okay, I must not use the laxative. I must use all these mind-body principles. I know it's that. But when your system is, is in so much fight or flight, you do need to use the laxative. Uh, you, you're just creating more trauma, more stress. But okay, okay, every day. And, yeah, so I, I think, does that make sense what I've said? Like, yeah, it becomes just, another conflict and then you're hurting yourself. Exactly. And then you're creating even more stress and even more um, perceived danger and fear and you just need to break that cycle sometimes with an, a, a tool like a medication Absolutely. or whatever it is 100%. just to then reboot and start implementing the other things again 100%. otherwise you're just causing more suffering to yourself I think the three of us will agree that you know you have a you, we, we're all you know, everybody's studying about the vagus nerve and everybody knows about the parasympathetic rest and digest I mean you have a pharmacy inside of you. Taking a deep breath in and exhaling creates enormous chemical reactions. You have anti-inflammatory, anti-spasm. You have, you have cannabinoids. You have marijuana. You have heroin. You have opioids. We are creating opioids. A hug for two minutes. You got to hold on for two minutes. Creates oxytocin. So we are talking about a pharmacy inside of you that God gave us that we don't even realize we can tap into. So my feeling is to be your own medicine at some point to realize you can be your own anti-anxiety uh, pill and work on that and, and even placebo that, well, okay, I'm gonna take half a medicine, I'm gonna take half a pill 
then I'm going to bring in this calming by my breathing, by my relaxation, by my going for a walk, by my being in nature, music. You know, um, Hanscom has a great video I put up a lot about anxiety stressors. He says, hum, sing, hum. I mean, these are chemical reactions in our brain. So you have a fan here um, because moonless sky. I love this moonless sky. (laughs) Thank you. I always feel out of control with flares, and it's a struggle to base myself back into the TMS theory. It ends up being this pendulum where I feel I need milder exposure. Mm -hmm. Your explanations make sense. I'm a male with IC symptoms I believe to be TMS. And and this person is a fan of yours, Dan. Maybe you want to address that, this um, second note about... um, the pendulum. Well, I think anytime we are experiencing a, a big increase in symptoms, uh, it's easy to go into panic. It's easy to go into fear. And I always say, let's remind ourselves of the fundamentals. And I've kind of documented four fundamentals, which is what's going on, what causes symptoms. Uh, and Moonless Sky will know perception of danger is what I always talk about. Uh, Sarno called it TMS. I don't think our brain understands what that term really means. So I'm using language that I think is more accessible to describing what it is. So first fundamental, know what's causing the pain. Second fundamental is, does that apply to me? So if you're in a big flare-up, oftentimes that's when we start doubting, isn't it? Like, oh no, why am I hurting so bad? It must not be TMS or perceived or it must be something real. Um, You know, and with somebody with uh, IC type of symptoms, it's like, uh uh-oh, maybe I've got an infection or something going on with the bladder. Um, But really, the first two fundamentals, know what causes pain and then know that it applies to you and that can kind of ground you again. The third fundamental is know that there's a solution and it is a mind-body solution. I don't believe there is a medical cure for a brain created problem. Meaning, you're going to a doctor, getting a pill, getting a shot, getting a manipulation, getting a this, getting a that. I don't think there's a medical cure to TMS or perceived danger pain. But you are the cure. And that's the fourth one. So it's what yeah. causes pain? Does it apply to me? Is there a cure? Yes, you are it. And the fourth fundamental is am I capable of implementing? Yeah. And that that trips up a lot of people because they're yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm too anxious and my pain is too severe. I've had it for too long. Yeah. But I think anytime you're in a flare up, moonless, just ground yourself on those four fundamentals. And the fourth one is really tough because people will say, oh, I believe it's TMS. I believe I have it. I know there's a cure. I've seen the success stories, but I don't know if I can do this. Mm-hmm. But sure you can, because I don't believe this is a healing process. I believe it's a learning or teaching process. We want to teach this misinformed brain that we're okay. And if you've learned anything in your life, you can teach yourself this. If another human being can learn this and apply it better, and you've got some heck of success stories, um, then you can do it too. So, what were you And I think on that, um, yeah, cultivating the patience with yourself that like a lot of the time if you are wired, you know, to be an anxious type person and then develop these kind of symptoms, it's going to take time to unlearn that and to to teach yourself a new way. And I think that's why, like, that's how I see any symptoms that show up in the physical body. They are there for a reason. They're there to teach us something and or multiple things. So things like patience, how to self-soothe, how to manage our anxiety are really important things. So perhaps if we can also shift that lens to, which is really, really hard, especially in a flare up, that this isn't my enemy, this is teaching me that I still have something to learn. Then we can look at it as part of our evolution as a person, you know, a part of our, our growth. So pain, pain is, is a message and um if you can see it as if you can find some meaning and purpose and i don't bring this up all the time with people because it's like what do you mean meaning and purpose i'm i don't feel good 
but if you can if you can see this as a message from the body and that you're not uh, being punished, that the body's protecting you, we're back to the brain, the body's protecting you. And if you can come away from it and see it as meaning and purpose, there's meaning in this, like your body created it. You know, um, I remember going to see Dr. Bernie Siegel in the University of Pennsylvania. I was still in my 20s and I took my mom who was in a, on a walker because she had MS and she raised her hand and said, to Dr. Barney Siegel, who wrote this great book, Love, Medicine, and Miracles, she stood up and she said, well, why did I get MS? And he outrightly said, well, you, you, you caused it. And I thought, well, I get this, but she's, she's going to crumble or, or not even, or it's just going to go right by her. And I thought, like, that's, how, that's, that's where he's coming from. And I have to agree that our bodies creates, created it and our bodies can solve it. That's the good news. Yeah, I think there's two things that I'd like to comment on, if I could. Um, yes. You know, that statement, you caused it, I think would make a lot of people feel worse. Yeah. Because I have a lot of people saying, I did this to myself. Are you kidding me? Yeah. yeah. Uh, and I don't like to place blame on anybody. I said, this is not your fault. It's where you ended up, but it's not your fault. So please let yourself off the hook. You know, most people who end up with perceived danger, pain, or other symptoms didn't get there through their willpower or desire. It just, it's where they ended up, their life history, their previous experiences, their traumas, their anxieties, and it builds up and eventually hits a tipping point, right? Um, Sarno thought it was all about repressed emotions, but I think it goes well beyond emotions. It can be virtually anything. Um, that the brain can perceive as danger. Um, so I don't particularly like saying, you know, you caused it. Sorry to disagree. That's okay. I disagreed also, but anyway, that was 40 years ago. <laughs> yeah. Um, and what was the other point I was thinking of? Oh, the message concept. Um, you know, Sarna used to think it was repressed emotions. Uh, and other people are like, oh, your pain is a message. And I think that can be a little bit tricky because for somebody who hears, okay, the pain is a message, I have to go find the message so I can get better. Or I have to go find the repressed emotion so I can get better. And that can lead to a never ending search. Like the rabbit hole. Because the, the perception would be, I still hurt. So I'm missing the message or I'm missing the repressed emotion. So I got to keep looking. And then they keep scrambling, digging and digging and looking. And they're missing the fact that they're still scared. Their brain's still perceiving danger. And the false alarm is still ringing in the background. And so I try to lead people back to, in my opinion, the direct cause and the direct answer, as opposed to some of the theories. Uh, because I can't even remember people who said, you know, Dan, I did all this. Uh, emotional work and I found this thing that happened in third grade and poof, my, my symptoms went away. I've been involved in this world for 25 years. I haven't heard that many stories like that. I can't remember anybody who has. Now, maybe you have, um, but I think the folks who do get better from the emotional work essentially have taught their brain that emotions are safe. But I think the, the biggest message, I mean, it can be that we're still stuck in fear, that that fear is still taking. Like I think with uh, uh, most of us, and maybe we can move on to talk about that fear pain cycle, like I think the core of it is often related to fear. So the message is in looking at the fear. Do you know what I'm saying? So it's not, a, it's not necessary. I, I fully appreciate what you're saying, like not going into all the reasons why because it's infinite it's an infinite well but if there's a like often people will say like i remember before i set my gp exams last year the night before now intuitively i knew that this was not my path and i've known that for a long long time and the night before i set the exams they were very, very expensive to sit and I felt this enormous pressure and I developed the most intense abdominal pain. 
that is not such a common feature of, of what my presentation has been. In and the message in that moment was, I knew it. It was like, this is not your path. So it's not about deeply always exploring, you know, going down that rabbit hole. But sometimes I think like nothing's black and white. Sometimes there is, there is a, a very obvious something calling out to be heard. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, that, that's the message mm -hmm. part for me of, of how that resonates. Yeah, and that's very valid, you know, because there are some people who just know something in my life is not working or not mm. in the direction. And the stress and the pressure, the self-imposed judgment, pressure, whatever, mm. those are perceived as dangerous. Mm. And the brain can turn on the symptoms as a warning signal to say, hey, 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 pay attention. So, yeah, I, I believe there are times when uh, the brain is protecting us against something that it perceives as, as not a good idea or as mm -hmm. safe. Um, but I think sometimes it's obvious, like in your case, you're like, wow, tomorrow I have this gut feeling that this isn't the right path and I have this gut feeling of severe pain. Easy to find that connection, but some people can't really find a connection or a message, and I don't want them <clears throat> to feel like they've got to search forever yeah. with it. It's like, and it's okay. Like, you know, I think we say to people, like, it's okay not to know. Like, I just don't know. I'm sure I don't know. But there is something driving your uh, brain to protect you. And I, I didn't learn this in chiropractic school, but I didn't realize that pain was an emotion and pain was processed in the same place as in the middle as fear and anger and guilt and these core emotions from our unconscious that drive our brain to protect us again your brain is doing what you're telling it i mean going back and studying the primal brain and it's it's doing a great job thank you brain the question is be a brain <laughs> do your job it's like i don't need you brain that now we're back to the compassion brain i got you it's okay. I, I'm going to take care of myself. And we're back to that's what you did, Talia. And Dan encouraged you like to take care of yourself. And you're like, I am taking care of myself. I look right inside. I'm in, I'm in a conflict. It's funny you say that because I was just thinking, um, so how many times Dan's video, your video about using your own name, and I would say, it's okay, Talia, this is just this. And, but it's really, really helpful. And I think you can use that in so many situations, you know, just talking to yourself, bringing yourself down. It's, it's, very, it's very powerful. Yeah, I want to jump to something because how hard is it to look in the mirror and talk to yourself? And tell yourself that you love yourself and you trust your body. And then, you know, the journaling is another whole aspect. And when Nicole Sachs came on the show a long time ago, we had Nicole Sachs and Michael Glinsky together with Rose and I. And I said, you know, a lot of people are not feeling journaling is helping them. And she came out and said, well, they're lying to themselves. And I was like, got to got to come clean. Got to come naked. I always say, like, naked with your clothes on. You got to be real with yourself and you got to be able to like yourself and what do you think about that dan and talia about how we don't like ourselves and how do we heal a body that we don't like um it all comes down to the perception of danger because if you don't like yourself or you don't like your body and you're verbally mentally attacking yourself the brain perceives that as danger. It's not going to feel safe. It's probably not going to turn off the symptoms as long as you're beating the crap out of yourself. Bullying yourself. Yeah. I mean, who likes to be bullied? But yet, for so much of the TMS mind-body world, um, we treat ourselves worse than we would ever treat any other human being. Right? We're so judgmental. We're so, so critical of ourselves. We're very perfectionistic, so when we embark on this mind-body work, it's like, okay, I got to do it perfectly, and all the pressure we put on ourselves, and you know, I'm, I'm not doing it right. 
I can't tell you how many times a week I hear people say, is this okay or is it going to sabotage my recovery? I'm like, it's not that cut and dry. I mean, it, this is... This is a walk. You're going to be off course sometimes, and you're going to have to correct, and you're going to have to figure out. And again, I just use safety as a guidepost. Are you moving towards safety or moving towards danger? Are the things you're thinking, saying, and doing, which which fork in the road are you taking? Am I towards safety or danger? Yeah. <clears throat> and by keeping it super simple, um, it helps people just navigate a little bit better because they're like, well, should I do this, this, and that? And I'm like, I can't map out your daily schedule for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but what if I go to the grocery store and this happens? And I'm like, right. you know, I can't answer that question. You know, they want a checklist. I want to just respond. Rita, I don't know if you know Dr. Talia St Steed. Uh, Rita um, LaBarba healed herself from uh, CP CRPS. <clears throat> she was on the show a few times with her. Her colleague uh, Tamara, Tamara uh, Quinn, and another amazing lady who did some videos with Dr. Schubiner about CRPS. They both had CRPS and healed themselves, which is quite. I mean, if we could just and CRPS is known to absolutely hundred percent BTMS. It is an autoimmune response. It is a very high level, you know, nervous system response, central sensitization, and we can help people with it. To the universe please don't struggle don't suffer but she says like what you said it becomes a habit and if we wake up in the morning and brush our teeth and drink our coffee and look at our messages on our on our whatsapp because we want to see what's happening in the world that's a habit so we can learn a habit the brain is it is it is it the brain is an organ it's kind of i call it a piece of flesh i mean it's a quite an amazing organ but it can learn a new habit Repetition, repetition, repetition. Um, Tova, I just wanted to say something um, back to what you said about loving yourself. Um, I think with all of Dan's like four um, fundamentals, they're, they're so powerful and so important. But I think the what you said is this ego resistance. So wh why people don't heal, why people don't get better. I think is that probably the hardest to face in ourselves because as when I was working in GP practice and this is like it's not meaning to upset anyone or anything it's you know it's a it's a gentle process of looking within often there can be what we call like a secondary gain from having a symptom and that secondary gain is where we're, we're actually getting a need met through having the symptom so we all know that if we're unwell, um, people might give us, you know, that validation, that attention. And sometimes when people aren't loving themselves, that symptom is the only way of getting any of that, that validation from an outside source. So the journey, they might be aware of all, all the rest of it, but their journey might be more about that cultivation of self-love so that they no longer need that symptom to get it from an outside source. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. very good point. And that, and that it's hard, you know, we were talking about dams on distress and all these other roles we can play. Sometimes it can be really hard for people to step out of the victim role that we can play so well into a more empowered role and stop talking about the symptoms, um, not just because we're distressed, but because we're getting that, some kind of energy from the other person. Um, that can be also one of the hardest things to actually gently put a stop to and just look within and see, is this one of the reasons I'm not getting better because I'm attached to this role and it's time for me to actually become an empowered person and heal for myself, which comes with that journey of self-love. Very good point because the person's in a cycle i mean they're kind of like they've learned pain and they've learned that pain gets their needs met in some way as well of of, of love so we have to go on the journey of realizing that we can find that from within and then all the other things can actually start to take effect because we we know that we don't need it anymore because we we, we we have to reach a point of being done with it yeah and going you know what i'm prepared to do whatever it takes 
to face this unknown state of being of what it means to be an empowered person to leave this victim role behind and it's not judging you would never say to anyone oh you're being in a victim role that that's not the that's not the right way to talk to anyone but it's about looking within am i am i stepping into that victim role and perhaps do i want these symptoms forever and if not perhaps i can learn gently to step out of it which is a slow process right what do you think about that dan the victim role well <clears throat> i know i've done a video on you know are you a victim um and i think i'm gentle about it as well i don't like blaming people or saying you know you're having a pity party but in some cases to be blunt they are um but they have to recognize that and decide i don't want to play that role anymore mm -hmm. step into their power step into their capacity to see things differently and move forward as opposed to wallowing in their symptoms um, and i don't want that to sound insulting to anybody but um, there is a reality there that some people just get lost in it and they stay there for you know, years or decades. Um, fortunately, the folks in our world are aware of the fact that there's a solution. So, and I, go ahead. Sorry, I think that thing about like the word victim role can sound so victims, that can sound so bad, but you know, like we all as human beings, we all carry like four archetypes in us. One of them is victim, one of them is child, saboteur, like saboteur. So it's, it's important to note that even those who are not suffering from TMS or perceived danger symptoms also carry these four archetypes. So it's not like there's anything wrong with the particular person or ourselves. It's that sometimes that archetype has needed to activate because we didn't feel like we were enough. We we might have had childhood things or whatever. We don't need to go into that. And so we needed to, to get our needs met. And so it's really that self-compassion that, okay, well, that mode has been activated. I recognize it. Don't want to stay in it. So how can I gently support myself to move into empowered state? Because I believe, like seeing in my own journey and with all the people I've encountered professionally working with them, that healing is really about empowering yourself there's always some kind of empowerment that comes through the journey of of having a chronic symptom oh, it's a very good point and i and i like people to know out there that i think and most of the the professionals in our field and the coaches and the amazing people that we've all met you know in this in this community we've all gone through it I mean, none of us are immune. Um, who was I talking to who was a good friend? Oh, yeah. Fred Amir last week um, knew Sarno. And he said Sarno had lots of back pain and anxiety. I mean, <laughs> Dan and I were talking. Sarno was, he was a very black and white. He wasn't a very compassionate person, Dr. Sarno, in his movies. You know, remember the guy who would, you know, come to his class and say, well, well what do I do? when I talk to somebody about my pain and they, they ignore me, well, don't talk to them. You know, like he was very black and white. And I think what people need to know is that we're, you know, we're, we're human beings. And Michael Galinsky says we have this condition called being human, you know, and um, it's a, it's a condition that we have to embrace and have a relationship with our ourselves. Um, I just want to say hello to Steve Monday, who's in living in Adelaide in Australia, Talia, somewhere in the east, in the west in, in Australia. And I, Steve's going to be on the show next week. I met him. He's the one I mentioned to you, Dan. Him and his nephew opened up this page called um, Mental Health Matters for Men. Let's talk. Nice. Let's talk. And he's got, you know, three, four thousand men chiming in every day 20 30 40 right. times a day in this incredible page about that they're that they want to be heard because they're a man and and women are, i i found the page and women can talk on the page and give advice and all but you know it's another whole part of our ability to express and steve and his nephew 
They went through their own anxiety. Their, the, um, his nephew had an addiction that he healed. And so they're, they're going to come talk about this and make this interesting. Look, we're human beings, men, women, you know, we're human beings. And um, I think what we're talking here is about the safety of expression. Mm -hmm. and, um, the holding back will hurt you first emotionally and then physiologically. So Steve's mentioning about how um, that uh, about, be, you know, he tried not to think that I'm a victim. So the simple process is not thinking or Steve, what do you think about accepting? Yeah, I feel like a victim. You know, I learned that as a child and still the, it comes up. The pattern still comes up. And Rose taught me that we have patterns of behavior. And if we don't accept them and understand our, how we use these patterns, you know, so then we're getting a little bit more deeper into our personality. I think, I think like for Steve, um, he's saying he's not a victim, but it, it might not relate. So I think the most important thing is one person's journey is not every person's journey, that everyone needs to really like a, a big thing that I write about is, you know, no one can prescribe our healing journey for us. Like that is part of it, connecting with ourselves. So this, this, this concept might not apply to him at all. That's fine. Throw it out the window. It's, it's just about finding the things out there that resonate for you and discarding the rest. Because really like modalities themselves don't, like I love going for Reiki because it's, something that resonates for me. Someone else might go for the acupuncture and that suits them. So so really, if the concept doesn't resonate, great, that's fine. You know, find an, a different one. All I'm saying is that if things are very, very chronic and someone out there who's watched Dan's videos every day for a very, very long time and is still suffering, perhaps they might like to explore, is there a subconscious resistance in my psyche to healing and perhaps one of those things could be being in a victim state. These are all just coulds and if you've reached a roadblock. If you've reached a roadblock like that and you're doing all the right things, then often there is some subconscious factor sabotaging you fully healing. That's, that's all that concept is about. Yeah. I just thought I'd explain that a bit more. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure Dan, when Dan, you know, you do your groups, you get to people who, um, they're, they're, they're not visiting themselves. They're disconnected from themselves. And what pain can teach us, when I mentioned about the message, like pain can work for you. How can the pain work for you? How can you channel this pain to work and this, and this personality, whether it be a victim or whether it be, you know, sensitive, how can... I tell men they're sensitive and it's wonderful. And they say, please don't call me that. I'm like, but it, because they don't want to believe it, it's, a, it's a beautiful quality because it's been, you know, whatever. But Dan, tell us a little bit about how you help people um, with, their, with their particular personality because it's, it's a very individual thing. You know, your, your videos are incredible, but everyone's got to apply it to their thumbprint, you know. Yeah, I don't spend a lot of time on personality traits because I don't want people to feel like I have to be a, an entirely new person to get better because that can be very overwhelming. True. I also don't like to point to stress. I know Moonless Sky was talking about here um, that it seems like his brain thinks life is dangerous. Anytime he gets stress, he claims his body um, reacts to it and goes into a flare. Um, and I'll point out for Moon in the Sky is, I don't think your body's involved. I think your brain is the control center for the human body. And if your brain is, <clears throat> if your brain is perceiving danger, it will turn on the signals and the symptoms will increase or come on. Um, but I, I like to help people realize that They've got a lot more control of, of what's going on. Control is a bad word. I say influence, mm -hmm. right? Excellent. I can't control the pain because people will say, ah, oh, you know, my pain was bad this morning and I took a bunch of deep breaths, relaxed my body and nothing happened. This stuff doesn't work. And I'd like to say, well, this is not a light switch. 
You can't just flip it off. We don't have conscious control over the symptoms or pains, um, but we can influence them with two things, what we expect and how we respond. What happens in the middle is up to the subconscious brain. And if the subconscious brain is keeping the pain on, it hasn't been convinced yet that you're truly safe. And, you know, consistency is super important. So if one day you're freaking the heck out mentally, emotionally, and your symptoms are reflecting that, then the next day you're saying, I'm safe, I'm good. It's okay, brain, I'm all right. Darn it, this stuff doesn't work. I'm trying it. Well, your brain's still going, what about yesterday? You're in a complete panic. Now you're telling me you're good? So it needs to be consistent over time for the brain to believe it. Um, so I don't really hone in too much on personality types. Um, I do notice and I do point out sometimes that you know, it's a perfectionistic tendency to want to do this just right and perfectly and do it tomorrow. Mm -hmm. um, but I try to instill patience, you know, usually don't like the term trust the process as a matter of fact i just did a video trust the process question mark <laughs> and i'm like no don't trust the process because some people assume that means we'll just keep watching videos and assume it's going to take care of itself over time you got to work the process and in my world you got to teach your brain that you're actually okay mentally physically emotionally yeah. maybe even spiritually yeah once you do that successfully, then the brain will start to yeah. let go of the symptoms. Yeah. Um, but you don't just trust it. Well, I'm learning, I'm watching, and I'm not getting better, so I don't know why it's not working. I'm trusting the process. No, you got to work the process. Yeah. Apply it again. We got to, you know, my, you know, applying and implementing is the key, and this is where we're coming out of our comfort zone. I mean, if you're not healing, take a look at look inside and see how you know but i did i did want to i did want to talk about the fear and i would like to ask you dan like how, when you were in your chronic pain how did you how did you how did you where did you put the, your fear in perspective because i'm sure that it was there well boy that was an up and down journey um the fear went in waves you know and it took me 13 years, 12 of which I knew about Sardo and had memorized his 12 daily reminders. And I had his videotapes on VHS. That's how long ago it was. And um, I didn't know it was all about fear. And so I made every mistake possible for 13 years. And I think I finally just had enough of it. I think Talia mentioned that earlier. I just. Yeah. I hit my head against the wall enough times and I just said, you know, I don't care. I'm just going to start living my life more, you know, I'm going to. That's such a good point. That's the solution. That's the healing. <laughs> Yeah, and you know what, Dan, what you say in your, that, that repetition of that go out and you live your life, I think that that really is important because I feel like for myself, like it was only very recently I kind of made a shift because I didn't know a life not seeking answers about these symptoms. Yeah. And so it was like I didn't know well, what's actually next. And that was actually very scary. But it came to a point, well, enough's enough. I don't care what's next. I want to move to what's next. And, and that's only going to come from just living as if it's over. And so – that's kind of been the next um, evolution of this journey for me. And I think it's, yeah, it's such, such an important thing to say. Like even that identity of the search for some answer um, and shifting that to, well, I'm just living my life and when this happens, I implement these things. Like sh shifting the focus is so important and so, so hard at some times, you know, some points. But once you kind of start to make it, it can become more of that default wiring. Well, I think what, what I... What um, Dan said, it's like he, he, he also made a decision to have a relationship with his brain and say, okay, brain, enough. Mm -hmm. Enough. I get, I get that you're tricking me. Like you, did you understand it was your brain back then? I mean, you, you, before you, you've been studying since. Yeah, I mean, I've, uh, 
you know, Sarna made it very clear that the brain was creating pain. Um, but I spent a lot of years, you know, trying to figure out the emotional side of it. Yeah. Mm. I, I journaled myself silly for six months and actually worked myself into a depression because all I was doing was every day writing about everything that was wrong with my life in my past, my present, my personality. And who wouldn't get depressed focusing on all that negativity for six months straight? I finally had to say, I can't do this anymore. Mm. Um, and so, you know, I love Nicole. We're friends. I've got her number in my phone. Um, she's referred clients to me. And um, But we're on just different ends of the spectrum with regard to journaling. Um, and it wasn't part of my solution. I tried it didn't work. It was several years later when I finally got better. Um, and I'm seeing a lot of people getting better without that. You know, this isn't a one no. thing doesn't work for everyone. It's not dead <laughs> science. Yeah. Nicole's extremely successful. She's got tons of success stories. So yeah. it's just, and, and, and like we said, like everything's just a tool. So if someone out there was journaling and every day writing out like letters to themselves, you're safe, it's, you know, this, that, then that can be really positive. Yes. So I think it's just realizing like the most important thing is there is no one fit. It's about you to take, mm -hmm. you know, what's all from, from all the information, use that, like use it with, dis look at it with discernment. Does this resonate for me? If so, great. Mm -hmm. Because some of your followers, you know, out there, Dan, they might love journaling. Um, and if it's working for them in a positive way, great. It's, it's just like there's no one fix. Yeah. And even people we respect, we might have differences on some things. And that's okay too. You know, Dan's healing journey would have provided him with the things he needed to help a lot of people. And someone else's will be slightly different because that's what they need to help different people. So I think it's really accepting that that. You know, like this 100%. so much yeah yeah i think we i think we could this is back to the fear, fear pain cycle there are people in in high in high levels of pain and will not uh respond to um you know like when your goal is to get rid of the pain and i know dan's addressed this it's a it's another conflict because mm. you're bullying and if your goal can be to understand the threat safety physiology, the, the you know, that you're not in danger, that's the goal. Mm -hmm. Indirectly, the sensations will shift. And if you can understand that your dials turned up to number 10 many times when we're in fear, so how can there be less sensations? We're gonna have to learn to, I read something in, in Joe Dispenza, I've been, sitting on my bed is the placebo. I'm reading that every night. And he's calling mental rehearsing. Mm -hmm. Let's visualize in your journaling, in your meditation, in your walking, just in your daily awareness that I can dial that dial down 10, nine, eight, seven. And I also, I can live with this sensation. I can, this sensation is not bothering me. It's not controlling my life. You know, it's, it's, it's a normal sensation. Like, Sarna would say. So here we're back to like, like bringing some tools to our listeners about the fear. If there's not a real threat, and even this woman, Dan mentioned, there was a threat, she broke her ankle, but she immediately understood her brain. Mm -hmm. And she was able to have a much better recovery. So what do you want to say, Dan and, and Dr. Tali about fear? And the fear of pain cycle, which is real, it's, it's a real cycle and, and, and harming some of us. What do you want to say, uh, Dan, about that the fear of pain cycle? Well, I mean, since my entire concept is based on the perception of danger, which is essentially fear, um, we're not recovering from our symptoms. We're not at all. The recovery is actually a recovery from fear. Wow. When, when we neutralize the fear, with accurate information as to what's actually going on and changing our obsession on it and recognizing that it's not doing us harm. It's uncomfortable. It's, it can be very difficult, horrible, uh, but it's not doing us harm. 
and it's just an experience we're having that's created by a false alarm in the brain, you know, I often say the brain is working flawlessly. So is the nervous system. It's, yeah. just, it's just operating on misinformation and fear. So recovery to me is not when the symptoms are all gone. It's when you've recovered from the fear and you don't mm. fear the symptoms. And it's when you no longer fear the symptoms, but guess what happens? Symptoms eventually start to go away. Yeah. We can't push them away. We can't make them go away. If we do that, we're always going to be focused on it and hypervigilant and drawing it back into our world. Um, I think pain will go away when you stop caring when it goes away and you're no longer afraid of it. And I think long-term recovery, people will say, yeah, but, you know, uh, so you mean when I'm done with this, I'll never have pain again? I'm like, no, who told you that? <laughs> you know, I still get symptoms once in a while, but they never become chronic because when they show up, I give it zero fears, zero attention. I call it out for what it is. I know what this is. This is the brain perceiving some type of danger. I'll sometimes connect the dots. Like, you know, when my mom had a stroke last year and I was sitting in the hospital and, you know, rehab facility with her for eight, 10 hours a day, I started developing back pain, but it lasted maybe a week and it never got severe and it never got chronic because I looked at it and I was like, I know what you are. I'm not, I'm not concerned. And so I love Nicole's quote, Nicole Sachs. She says, there's no cure for human pain but there is a cure for chronic pain. I love it. <laughs> it's exactly what I've just explained. And I think that's when we're truly rec recovered, when we can go on with our life and say, yeah, symptoms came up, but it didn't bother me. Whereas some people, and I know um, Moonless Sky is in this mode right now where he gets a flare up and he's back in it, like deep in it. And so, um, Moonless, see if you can really hone in on the fact that your body's fine. It's not involved. Get super clear on what's causing the symptoms and then just really uh, dive into messages of safety consistently and try not to let the flare up throw you into despair, anger, frustration, because that's just reiterating the danger as opposed to soothing. Beautiful. And if I could, just a quick shout out to Johnny. Yeah. Johnny is out in the San Diego area. And yeah. About four and a half years ago when I first started doing these videos, um, I was out in San Diego for a workshop and I just put out a post on Facebook saying, hey, I'm in town. I'll be at the bar at this hotel. If anybody wants to stop by and chat. And sure enough, Johnny and one other lady showed up and kind of been friends with Johnny ever since. So thank you, Johnny. I appreciate the dinner. <laughs> So ta, ta, Johnny's amazing. Um, yeah, on his healing journey. Tal, you, you, I know you need to leave. We're going to say goodbye in a minute, but you need to go. Did you want us to just say something about the fear pain cycle before you left? Um, no, I don't think I have anything to add on that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, but I just, I do want to stay on it a little bit more, Dan, if you want to hang out with me, it's nighttime for Dan. Sure. And, um, but, uh, there, somebody's asked about the dizzy disorder, and how do we stop the sensations of rocking and swaying? So I, I want to first address that and then ask Dan to address it. First of all, any any autoimmune symptoms, I've come out on the record and talking about they're all it's TMS, it's mind body, it's the body attacking itself, and the same rules and um, compassion and it, it all applies. And I I think we can address that the same way. It doesn't matter about the symptoms. It matters about your relationship with your body and knowing yourself and understanding your brain. And so to stop the sensations of rocking and swaying, it's not about stopping or getting rid of. It's about understanding your body's reaction and you know, calming yourself down in many, many different ways. And also trusting that this is your body's nervous system. It's on high alert. And just to use the same you know, neck tools and you know, I have tons of information coming out on my Facebook page and Dan's showing up every day. And, you know, you can always contact us personally, website internal, you know, uh, on the internet and get information. But you're, it's good that you're showing up here, Jill, and asking these questions because you're 
looking at the real truth of why you're having these symptoms. But anyway, um, um, I just wanted to say, if anyone else wants to ask a question, we're here for another few minutes um, out there. There's been a lot of people visiting this, the uh, virtual studio and I'm one blessed human being to be able to, um, to bring you all Dr. Talia Steed from Australia and Dan Buglio from New Hope, Bucks County, my, my, near my hometown. And there's one more message coming in. Cheryl's always chiming. Cheryl, I love you very much. She's in uh, Australia and worked with Rose and I and really had it. Cheryl had every itis. Talk about itis. She had every itis under the sun and healed through these methods, through ISTDP. And she's very deep and spiritual and all leaves beautiful comments. Um, I love you, Cheryl. Good to see you. Um, Chris, nice to meet you. I'm glad that you um, learned from this discussion. This is number 100 and I think 68 broadcast. Talk about weekly. Dan goes daily. I go weekly um, uh, on my on my YouTube channel, and this will be on the YouTube channel tomorrow. Any questions you can ask me, and Dan will. If any questions for Dan, I'll send them to Dan. But you all have his information, and Dr. Talia Steed and I may come on a little bit more often and do some shows together. Um, I always like to say, Dan, if anybody that you know wants to be in this broadcast, it's not about like come when you're cured. I mean, God cures as far as I'm concerned, but right. come when you're in your journey and come share with us and express yourself in the safe place in my studio. And it's very healing to work through your process here in the studio. And it would be a wonderful thing if anyone would like to come in the studio at any point and be on the show, um, be in the broadcast, I'd be honored to to meet you here. And if you have anyone who wants to come, because it, uh, you know, like I remember the first show we had um, was with, first it was Michael Galinsky, then it was Laura DeMonte. Laura, she's now become a coach herself. And she had a migraine before the show. And I said, perfect, let's go. She was like, I know, let's do it. And it became this healing thing. When people would come on the show, they would help their healing. So anybody out there would like to be a guest, Talia and I can host you. I'd be honored. Just putting that out there to you, Dan, also, and to you, Talia, your clients. Um, anyway, anything else, any last parting words anyone wants to say before we, we say goodbye? Um, I just want to address uh, Jill Ratto and the uh, sensations of dizziness and rocking. Sorry, sorry, before you do that, I actually have to go right. to, to be okay, Talia. So thank you so much. It's been so wonderful to meet you, Dan, and um, see you again, Tova. Um, and thank you again, Dan, for all you do. It's amazing. And you, Tova. Um, and, yes, I will hope to see you again. Okay, have a wonderful day. Okay, thank you so much. So Bye. good to meet you, Talia. So go ahead, uh, Dan. You can address Jill's uh, question. Yeah, so... Um, I just wanted to point out that if Jill hasn't seen it yet, I do have a success story of somebody with persistent dizziness. Uh, her name is Kim K Y M. Um, I think it's, yeah, I think it's K Y M. Um, oh, the but, woman with the long blonde hair from who works with yes, she's amazing. She has had dizziness. She's yeah uh, yeah yeah. So if you go to painfreeusuccess.com. It'll link you to my success story playlist and look for Kim. It may be K-I-M, I forget. Um, yeah. But she had a, a bout of dizziness for about five years and she's like 95% better. And it's interesting in that success story, um, it turned into a coaching session because she was like, you know, and this might be as good as it gets. And I'm like, no, if you got 95% better, you can get all the way better. So it, it's interesting. So Jill, check that out if you haven't seen it yet. Um, and I think that might help you that discussion because we got deep into the, the dizziness. And again, it's all perception of danger. You can't directly stop the sensation of rocking, but you can influence it by how you respond when it happens. Beautiful. So hopefully that helps, Jill. Beautiful. So blessings out to all of you. And... Um, just, you, we got your back. We got your back. <laughs> That's all I'm going to say. We got your back <laughs> and your front and your sides. 
Um, God bless you to all you out there, Dan. Take good care of yourself. Thank you so much. I'm so happy to meet you in person. Yes. And um, maybe we won't even meet again. Um, if you ever get bored, you want to come on my show and just have a conversation. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Okay. All the best. Thank you so much. Take good care. All right. So long. Okay. One second. Yeah.